through an interesting pathways, and I won't go into it, I got involved in, in under, trying to understand appetite regulation. Uh, I'm not a neurologist, so some of this is still foreign to me five, six, seven years into it. Um, I, my goal is to try to put together the biology, the physiology of what controls our food intake and our energy balance, and some of the psychology and how your brain can kind of look at interactions. Uh, so certainly there are people out there that are a lot smarter than me that know more about the brain itself or know more about the psychology or know, know more about the physiology. I try to put all those things together and think about it as a, as a whole. And we got interested in exercise and physical activity for the obvious reasons. It's an important part of what we do every day. And we have some great researchers here who do exercise uh, studies. And I said one day, I was like, why are we collaborating? Why aren't we working together? And I'm going to show you some data uh, from a research study that we did in collaboration. Uh, it was a pilot study, and now we have two larger grants to continue this work going. So the idea is, how does physical activity or exercise, if you want to use the E word, impact appetite regulation and therefore body weight regulation in the brain. I want to preface it. Exercise is good for everybody. The more, the better. It's good for uh, cardiovascular health, metabolic health, uh, mental health. I'm not going to go into cognitive functions and improve. I mean, all, everything is better with exercise. So it's not like I want to stand up here and say, for some people, exercise is no good, right? Because it's good for everybody. But what I'm going to concentrate is on actually body weight regulation. Is exercise the right tool for weight loss and weight loss maintenance for, for everyone? And, uh, and again, I don't want to be negative about exercise because I'm very positive and pro-exercise. So I just want to uh, start with that, that, that caveat. So I'm going to start with a couple of cases because I'm a clinician and I like to put this in real world context. All right, so our first one is a 36-year-old overweight woman who wants help with losing weight. So that's a good start, right? She wants help, so that's good. Uh, so she wanted to get healthy and lose weight as her New Year's resolution, which is pretty common, I think. Uh, and so she joined a fitness center on January 2nd. And uh, she went, you know, five days a week and spent the 45, 60 minutes up on the treadmill and the ellipticals. And she was doing a little bit of weight training. Um, and she did this for three months. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she started feeling a little bit better, but then, she wanted to lose weight, and she got on the scale, and her weight was no different than it was on January 1st when, before she started this whole program. So she's very frustrated because she hasn't lost weight. Uh, she hasn't changed her diet during this time. She feels like she's a fairly healthy diet, but she really was concentrating on the exercise as the way to, to get to better health and, and lose weight. So her question for me was, why haven't I lost weight? What else can I do? And she asked this in, in, in frustration. So, you know, when I see this, this is a very, very common scenario. And we did a little news blurb a few months ago, and we were interviewing people downstairs in the fitness center, and it was the same exact story. People were going down there, working out, and they weren't losing any weight. And it took a lot more uh, in terms of other interventions. So, why hasn't she lost weight? Um, the weight training, muscle mass uh, weighs okay. more than, what, the lean body or, or fat? So that's a... Very common misconception is that I went to the gym, so now I've got all this lean mass, I'm going to weigh more. It is true. You're, what you're saying is true. But with the day, you know, 15, 20 minutes, three times a week of lifting weights, that's not enough muscle mass to make a big difference in her overall mass. Yes, if she all of a sudden was going into bodybuilding, that's a whole other you know, deal. But just in the typical patient, a person who goes to the gym, does mainly aerobic, a little bit of resistance, you're not going to change a lot of your muscle mass. Uh, so probably that's not it. Um, so what else could be happening? She's clearly added exercise. I'm not doubting it. So certainly she could be lying and not doing it at all, right? So she, we could go to the gym and find out how often she comes in there. Um, but certainly we believe that she goes in there. And that should be, you know, on, on average, two, 300 calories of burn if she's really going on these machines at a reasonable rate. That does bring up an, an important point is when you get on those machines and they calculate your, how many calories you burn, they grossly overestimate uh, your calories burned for the most part. You know, our machines down here are perfect, right, Joe? <laughs> so they're much more accurate, but it, it's not very accurate. So if you think about going for about 45 minutes, maybe that's a few hundred calories. Uh, depends on the intensity, obviously. But certainly we would have expected her to have lost some weight over three months. Um, so either she's less active the rest of the day, right? So if she all of a sudden stopped moving because she's exercising, 
Maybe she's overall burning less calories. Or maybe on the two days a week that she's not exercising, maybe she's being less active because she said, well, I exercise five days this week. I can be a couch potato all day. And maybe before then, she was active on the weekends. Uh, so maybe she's down-regulated. She's, she's, her, her general activity uh, and her fidgeting, is, as Dr. Uh, um, Levine would say. On the other hand, maybe she's compensated by uh, uh, taking in more calories. And that's really what I am hypothesizing is the main issue here and, and it will concentrate on. Or what else could be going on? There could be a, a lot of other things. Certainly, uh, we'll talk about that. All right. Is exercise not a good tool for weight loss? You know, I think that's a, a question. It doesn't seem to work very well for this lady, does it? Uh, and that's what we're going to get into. All right. Does compensation occur? And I would say that likely yes. All right, let's go to case two. So this is a 36-year-old <coughs> overweight man who's gained weight over the last year or so, uh, or over the last four to six months after having surgery for a bad knee injury, and he's been slowly rehabbing it. Um, so he's gained some weight, and now he's been cleared to exercise again, to start running. Three months later, he's lost 15 pounds, and he feels good. He's also tried to eat a little more healthy during this time. So something's different about this guy. <coughs> so why did he lose weight with exercise compared to the other 36-year-old individual in the first case? Uh, did he just burn more calories than the woman in case one with his exercise? Certainly, he's a guy, so he's probably a, bit, a little bigger, and so he maybe is burning more calories. Uh, did he simply cut his caloric intake? Did he eat less, uh, either on purpose or not on purpose, and that led to his weight loss? Does exercise impact his physiology differently, or does it impact his psychology differently? Uh, these are all things that we're interested in. So are his behaviors more conducive to dealing with changes in the environment, like exercise and things like that? All right, so how does he adapt? And that's what I want to talk a little bit about. All right, so we're going to talk about the effects of physical activity on body weight. Um, so a couple of true statements, I think. Physical activity or exercise, and we use those interchangeably, uh, in of itself has been shown to only have modest effects on weight loss, on average. And I think that's a very important, in quotes, statement is on average. And so if you look at research studies that just do exercise, don't impact the food at all, the diet, you see about, on average, about a 3% weight loss, which is not nothing. 3% does have health benefits. But 3% is not what our patients are looking for. It's not what the general public is looking for when they go on a weight loss treatment plan. So it's quite modest. Physical activity, though, accentuates diet-induced weight loss. So there's studies to show that the two together is better. But physical activity is important in minimizing weight gain and regain. And I know you've heard about this already, that if People who've lost weight and kept it off, what is one common denominator? Is they exercise quite a bit. So physical activity does seem to be a good tool for weight loss maintenance, but maybe not for weight loss. But I think at the end of the day, I think the last statement is very important. There is significant inter-individual variability in the response to an exercise intervention. And that's, I think, the same thing goes with our diet interventions, our drug interventions, exercise, Regardless, if you look at individual people and what happens to their weight, it's all over the place. So all these research studies report means and averages, but the reality, that doesn't necessarily mean a lot for the individual sitting in front of you and you know, me in my clinic, uh, or if it's you trying to lose weight. What works for you may be very different from the next person. And this is show, I'm just going to show you a couple of research studies. Uh, Kasich in Pittsburgh did this study. It was an 18-month physical activity intervention. And what did he find? That about a, whoops, sorry about that. You, that was not the right button. Uh, what he found is that about a third of the people didn't lose any weight at all. A certain percent gained weight over time, and then a certain percent lost weight. So there seemed to be these three groups of individuals of people who lost weight, gained weight, or didn't lose weight at all. Um, so again, a lot of the variability there. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, in the weight gain part, um, could it be that they're developing more muscle and that? It could be some of it, but again, most of these exercise interventions are more aerobic exercise, okay. and you wouldn't expect a significant amount of muscle mass. Uh, so 
Likely, not necessarily. Okay. Here's another study. This is Tim Church. This was when he was at Pennington Center in, in Louisiana. And what you see is that they did a study where they had exercise, non-exercise controls over here, people at low amount of exercise intensity and then higher intensities. And this is individual data. These are patient, these are sub research subjects. And what you see is some of these subjects, I think I highlighted on my slides here, you see some of them lost a significant amount of weight with exercise. I mean, some of these people, this is not exercise, but with exercise, up to 15 kilos in some individuals. It's a huge, huge amount of weight in six months. But then you had some individuals who gained weight with the exercise intervention, and then you had this mix in the middle that didn't do either. And so there's a number of studies which suggest that the numbers are either a th about half and half. Half lose a clinically significant amount of weight, and half don't lose weight or even gain weight. And we have similar evidence. This is a smaller study, uh, but with my collaborator, Ed Melanson here, um, where we did the same thing, six month, pretty real life exercise intervention. And what we found is that about half of the individuals lost weight with this exercise intervention, and the other half either didn't lose weight or in fact gained some weight. So then the average weight loss on all of these is pretty small because there's this such variability. And you see the same thing in diet studies, drug studies, et cetera. And so when I started looking at these data, I started thinking, well, this is what's interesting. It's not that the average weight loss was two or three kilos. It's why are these people losing this much weight? Why are these people gaining weight? I want to understand that variability. I want to can I predict it? Because if I can predict whether they respond to these different interventions in different ways, maybe I can hone in and treat those individuals more aggressively with exercise, or these more aggressively with a low-carb diet, and these more effectively with a, a drug, for example. So trying to understand those parameters that would predict that. Mark, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Um, this was an exercise-only intervention. Did you question them at the end about whether they had changed their diet on their own? Did you, were you somewhat aware of what they were eating? In this study, I wasn't involved in the original uh, plan, and we did not have dietary intakes pre and post. In okay. the studies we're doing now, we are looking at that. In a sub-study of these, we've studied these people with other tools, which I'll show you later, uh, which suggests that their diet habits didn't necessarily change. Um, but again, you started an exercise intervention, you perhaps are gonna get healthier because you feel good, especially if you're a person losing weight, you're more motivated. If you're gaining weight, you're going, what the hell? <laughs> I'm gaining weight with exercise, why should I put any more effort into anything? Um, so really, there are some important issues as, as you bring it up. But the other thing is what others have found is that if you predict the amount of weight loss somebody should have had with the just pure calories burned from the exercise, typically people, don't lose as much weight as predicted uh, in these type of studies. But there's so many variables here that it's, it is hard to make those predictions, number one. <coughs> number two, we expect that there are gonna be other changes in, their, in, in eating behaviors, physical activity, et cetera. Yes, Jim. Just real quick, if you did the exact same experiment with rats, do you see the same thing? With rats, I think some depends on the model, <laughs> the, the, the uh, um, proneness to, to weight gain, but certainly rats are better at uh, really staying where they're supposed to. The other thing is, are you talking about like free living uh, access no, actually, to? I was, I was thinking about if you did an exercise intervention and you didn't, you didn't change the diet. Right. I was, I was just thinking about, because you're eliminating the cognitive component when you're studying a rat. Right. So they're not going to say, oh, I exercise so I can have four more Big Macs. Um, I just wondered. Yeah, you know, and I don't know all the data on rat literature. Okay. I, I try to stay away from it. Cause I, I started my research career in rats, and I found that rats were not a very good model of what I was studying. So, but certainly, um, you know, I think rats are pretty good at adjusting their calories. So my guess would be that rats would not lose weight. They would maintain, eat enough calories to compensate for the burn. And that's what we showed with some other studies, other interventions. All right, so if you ex start exercising, so you're burning calories now, you're in negative energy balance, and I know you guys have talked about these kind of things the last couple of days. How could one adapt to that? So in theory, you start exercising, don't change anything else, you should be losing weight at a certain rate based on how many, how many calories you're burning. But there, the body compensates potentially. So what are those modes of compensation? So certainly, energy expenditure could go down. 
Your basal metabolic rate could go down. That has never been shown with exercise. If anything, we would expect basal, basal metabolic rate might go up just a little bit. It's this non-exercise activity that Jim Levine likes to talk about that might be impacted. Maybe people become more sedentary as they start exercising. And that's what my collaborator, Ed Melanson, is interested in. That was the whole hypothesis of his study, is that he's measuring energy expenditure. He expects that that will go down uh, when you start exercising. So it's that whole concept of, I start exercise, so now I don't have to take the elevator today. I mean, I don't have to take the stairs. I'm going to take the elevator because I worked out at lunch today. And that is a very common phenomenon. Yes? What about the thought that, um I don't even know if it's true or not, but I've heard it a lot that people say, well, you know, I, I exercise and, and so I need a day for my muscles to rest or whatever. What you, what, what's the truth about that? Right. Well, the truth is, it's, it's so, so certainly if you're just starting exercise, you might have soreness. You want to work that out. But certainly that's not what you want to do. Because, and that might be part of the problem is there's this conception that maybe now I have to rest because I worked out and I'm going to be less active. So my overall energy expenditure doesn't go up, and so then I don't lose any weight. So that's certainly part of the equation here, but not, I can't potentially explain all of it here. Yeah. And I have a really good question. So if, if I cut the calories I eat per day, I would want to exercise less. So right. wouldn't it be the same? That, that happens too. So when people go on a diet and they don't lose the expected amount of weight, why not? Well, maybe because now they're moving less because they don't, their, their body's trying to compensate for the extra calories burned and saying, you're out of balance, let's get you back in balance. And so it's the, the opposite, yes, that's possible. Now, we also have nutrient metabolism that's important in how, in our body weight regulation. So it might be that exercise is associated with less fat burning or, or, bet, or increased nutrient absorption. I don't know that there's any evidence for that, but I just wanna be complete in my thought process about what's happening here. Finally, there could be effects on food intake and appetite regulation. This could be changes in biologic signals that exercise changes some of the biology or physiology related to food intake. It could be that it's more cognitive or behavioral in nature or a combination of these things. And that's really what I have concentrated on here uh, the rest of the time and in my research, is when you start exercising, is there compensation? Do you start eating more uh, because you're hungrier, because you're in negative energy balance, and now you make up for those burned calories and at the end of the day, you're in energy balance and you don't lose any weight. And does that happen more in some individuals than others? All right, so does physical, physical activity or exercise impact the regulation of food intake? And if so, how? So let's look at just real quickly some, some of these other studies that have been done. So we can measure hunger, and certainly this is an acute uh, study looking at walking. And you see that exercise is here. There's a little bump where hunger is a little increased on average in these people. But then after, as time goes after the exercise, hunger ratings are pretty similar whether you exercise or didn't. So maybe a little bit hint of increased hunger. Now, this is, an op this is a study they did high intensity exercise, uh, a group in, out of uh, Great Britain. And this is a really complicated slide, but I want, it's really pretty amazing. So you have control, that's these little dots here, and here's what's happening in the control. And these are just measures of hunger. It's a, it's a visual analog scale, so it's how hungry are you, not at all or very much so. And uh, what you see is you start your day off kind of hungry, you eat breakfast, your hunger goes down, hunger goes back up, you eat lunch, goes down, goes back up, dinner goes down. If you put, we put you on a diet, reduce your calories, Hunger values are here in food deficits, so it's these triangles. Hunger does never go down all the way, because mm. up higher. So you're hungrier through the day if you go on a diet. Okay? That makes sense, right? Less calories, so you're hungry, right? Now we take the same amount of calories that you have in your diet, but it's, we have you eat the same, and now you reduce those calories by exercise. Right? And this is this other curve here, which follows the control day. So appetite or hunger seems to be blunted with exercise, when it's high intensity exercise at least. So very interesting. So there's some evidence that exercise can blunt hunger in some individuals, especially when it's higher intensity exercise. Um, I'm gonna skip that, there's a little too much. Um, okay, but the reality is, again, when you, you look at these means, it's one thing, but let's look at the individual people and what happened to their hunger ratings. So this is a study that did hung that did walking over a period of time. I can't remember. I think this was 
uh, a week's type of study, and they look at hunger ratings. And what we see, there's some individuals, hunger and energy intake went up. In some people, it went down, and in some, it was in the middle. And my guess is if this was a long enough study, this would track with the people who would lose weight, this would track with the people who would gain weight. So again, there's something very different happening from one individual to the other. So we can't just generalize and say, uh, exercise reduces hunger, because I've heard people say that, because that's not necessarily the case. And probably each one of you have had a different response when you go exercise. Sometimes you feel less hungry, sometimes you feel hungrier. It depends on the type of exercise, it depends on the individual. And this is another study that look again, this was a 12-week study, and they looked at energy intake and hunger ratings, which correlated. So we have hunger here, energy. So there's a correlation here. So the hu hungrier you are with exercise, the more food intake. The less hungry, the less energy intake. But you see a lot of noise, right? You see that some individuals had increases in hunger, some individuals had decreases in hunger. Some had increased in intake, some had decreases in intake. So there's a lot of noise there. There's obviously a correlation, but certainly much inter-individual variability in this 12-week intervention. And this relates to body weight as well, uh, which, as you would expect, th those who were hungrier ate more, didn't lose weight. Those who had less hunger ate less and lost weight over this 12-week period of time. All right. All right. So this is my little cartoon of what might be happening for the people who don't lose weight. So you have your body weight here. You start a physical activity or exercise intervention. You have an increase in energy expenditure. Now you're in negative <coughs> energy balance. Your body weight goes down. But then something happens that causes your appetite to go up. Again, whether that's biology, psychology, or what, it's probably a little bit of both. Your weight starts to stabilize. You start to eat more. Now you regain that weight. And that, this might be a half pound, one pound, happens very quickly that this kind of regulation or compensation occurs. It's not like you've lost 10 pounds and then all of a sudden you start regaining it. It's probably occurring very early that these changes in appetite regulation are occurring. Now, in the people who don't, um, excuse me, the people who do lose weight with exercise, something different is happening. And this is my hypothesis, is that in those individuals, physical activity certain amount of body weight, you have increased energy expenditure, but the physical activity or exercise does something to block appetite regulation like these people. And so you have more weight loss and maintenance of that weight loss over time. So there's something happening here that the physical activity is affecting the appetite regulation that's occurring or compensation that's occurring in these other individuals. That makes sense? Okay. All right, so what is regulating these differences in appetite? And energy or food intake. So obviously there's a lot of interest in this. It even makes Time Magazine, you know, the whole science of appetite, uh, really boomed in the mid-90s when leptin, the hormone, was discovered. And, and then since then, this whole field has really taken off uh, in many, many, many directions. So certainly that's part of what I do. So I know you've probably had some of this already, but I think it's important to set the stage with how exercise impacts this. So energy, homeostasis, or the physiology of food intake. So we know that adipose tissue or fat is important because it makes this hormone leptin. It feeds back to the brain. What does leptin do? It stimulates what we call catabolic pathways, which are our going to pathways that have you increase the amount of energy you burn a day. Leptin also has a negative effect on anabolic pathways. That's the food intake pathways, the hunger. So that leptin is somewhat of a long-term satiety hormone and also gets you to move more, right? So the more fat you have, the more leptin, and get, it's trying to get your body back to its homeostasis, back to its lower body fat level, and so trying to shrink this down. And certainly we know that that's what's happened. So at the end of the day, leptin helps you reduce your food intake, increase your energy intake. Uh, and expenditure. The hormone insulin, which is from not from fat, but from the pancreas, is a marker of fat tissue. The more fat tissue we have, the more insulin resistant we are and the higher insulin we have. Insulin does very similar things in the brain to reduce food intake, increase energy expenditure. There's this false conception out there that insulin makes you eat more. Because our diabetic patients gain weight when they go on insulin. Insulin in the brain does the opposite. It is 
it makes you less hungry, uh, and that's been well shown uh, in studies in animals. And now with nasal insulin, uh, we can show that that cuts appetite, actually. So it's just like leptin in that respect. These are long-acting signals, but we know on a day-to-day -day basis, yes? Why aren't they marketing insulin to fat people? To, to well, sleep? because subcutaneously in insulin-resistant or patients with diabetes, you take an individual who can't take glucose and put it in their cells, you give them insulin, now the sugar goes in their cells and they gain weight because they're, they're going from a catabolic state to an anabolic state. And so yes, you do get weight gain with insulin, but it's not through increased appetite per se. Okay. And so there, there are researchers who are looking at intranasal insulin that gets into the brain more specifically that might have different effects on body weight regulation. To see whether, yeah. see whether it would actually keep right. people from eating so much. Okay. Sure. We also have meal-to-meal -meal regulation of food intake. So here we have our intestinal tract, which is a key endocrine organ that we've you know, discovered in the late 90s, early 2000s. So hormone ghrelin, you may have heard of, is released by the stomach and is a, quote, hunger hormone. So it's high when, you're not, when you haven't eaten in a while. You eat, the levels go down, and they go back up before the next meal. So people call this a hunger hormone. I don't know how true it is because in our, in our hands, People, it doesn't correlate with hunger at all. But nevertheless, in animals at least, it does. Ghrelin feeds back to the brain and it stimulates hunger, anabolic pathways. We have hormones that are released after a meal from the intestinal tract. One called PYY or peptide YY, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. These are released again after a meal. They feed back to the brain and they inhibit these anabolic pathways. So they're satiety type hormones and those have been shown pretty well. So how does exercise affect these things? Certainly, exercise is associated with reduced leptin, with reduced insulin. Some of that is due because of the weight loss associated with exercise, which is interesting because if you have less leptin, you would think these people are going to be hungrier and eat more, yet some of our research subjects eat less and are losing weight despite lower leptin. That might be that leptin works better in these individuals. So leptin, uh, we know that people who are obese have high leptin levels, which, and we call that leptin resistance, meaning it's not working effectively. So exercise has been shown in animals to improve that leptin resistance. So it may be that part of what we're seeing is that as uh, people lose weight, leptin levels go down, but they, people are more responsive to leptin, and so it's working better at a central way leading to reduced food intake and weight loss. PYY, GLP-1, these are satiety hormones, tend to go up with exercise, and we tend to see some increased satiety and less hunger in these individuals. Ghrelin is a little bit all over the place, and so it's hard to know how important that is with exercise. All right, so the physiology is super important, but as so is the non-physiologic regulation of food intake. As John pointed out, especially in humans, there are so many other factors that are important for why we eat. It's not just those biologic signals that are important. It's the whole concept of, I just ate a big meal, my hormones, my PYY is high, my GLP-1 is high, my ghrelin is low, it's telling me to stop eating. I feel full, yet somebody brings the dessert tray and you eat it, right? Outside of that biology, you are continuing or choosing to continue to eat based on just the food being there and available. So there's clearly other inputs that are important. And I separate these out into two separate categories. Internal inputs, so reward mechanisms, cravings, just the thinking of food. There's studies that do this. They'll have you think about food or not think about food and see how that impacts things. Restraint is trying to hold back. Learn behaviors. You know, if you, you know, every time you get hurt, your mom gives you a sweet, all of a sudden you, you, you associate feeling bad with in an eating sweet and it makes you feel better. And so that's a potentially learned behavior. Attention is very important as well. Then we have external inputs, so inputs from the environment, so cues. Seeing food is very important and that's why a lot of our research is based on this. Uh, you know it's available. If it's, if, you, if it's not there, it's not available, you're not gonna be as interested. But you know it's there, you're gonna eat it, you're gonna seek it. The smell, aroma is very important, and taste ultimately is gonna be a strong driver of uh, what we eat. When you go to the mall, 
what's the first thing that happens when you open that door? Cinema. Cinema, right? That's so powerful, <laughs> right? So we know, and, and you, that might drive you to go have a cinema. I, 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 I have restraint, so I don't, but some people don't. And so that is an external cue that was outside of your biology. Yeah. So we're going to ask about attention. Does that mean paying attention to what you're doing or getting attention for your No, body? it's paying attention to what you're doing, focusing on, on your internal self, that kind of thing. So availability portions are ex important external inputs. We know that the bigger the portion, the more likely you are to eat more food, for example. Social context. Some people eat more when they're around others. Some people eat less when they're around others. Uh, so it really does depend. Time cues. You might not have been hungry at noon today, but it was lunchtime, so you ate. You know? it's so it, it might be that if time cues weren't there, we would eat very differently, and certainly those are important. So there, and there are many more non-physiologic uh, factors that are important to consider. So I, this is my little model, is that you have your physiology, so you have your fat signals, you have your intestinal signals. They affect the brain in this part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And that affects energy intake or food intake directly. So that's the biology. But then we have the non-physiologic signals. So those internal, external inputs that communicate. And those may directly impact food intake. Like I mentioned, bringing the dessert tray after a full meal. This is telling you don't eat anymore. This is telling you to eat because you love that cheesecake. Um, and it's so good, even though I'm about to burst. But I think also important is that there's more and more evidence that these, these factors interact with these factors. So that, for example, leptin impacts the, the reward system and vice versa. And these will ultimately impact energy intake through these pathways. So it's very, very, very complicated, uh, but certainly uh, I try to, try to simplify it. My feeling is this biology is somewhat of a problem. It promotes food intake. Most of these signals do. But really, the bigger problem are these. This overpowers these signals. And that's why it's so difficult for us to be lean in our environment. All right. So when we want to look at the effects of exercise on food intake, what can we measure in humans? As John mentioned, we can do a lot of things to rats and really get some great answers. But at the end of the day, I want to know what happens in, in our species. And so what can we measure? Uh, what's been done out there? So we can measure behaviors. There's a lot of different things that you can measure there. We can measure appetite ratings, but they're very subjective. So I've asked you if you're hungry, and if I ask you if you're hungry, your answers may be very different. Um, there's a lot of subjectivity to what hunger or wholeness means. We can measure energy intake, but how accurate is that? This is a very difficult thing in our field. So on one hand, we can bring you into the lab, measure everything you eat, and we can get a good assessment of how much energy you consume. The problem is you're in a lab. That's probably going to affect the way you eat, <laughs> right? Because you know you're being studied. You know that you're not out you know, doing your thing, not thinking about things. And so that's going to impact how you eat. So then we can measure it free living out in the real world. Well, there's a lot that goes into this. We can measure, do it with di diaries. But how accurate is the diet diary? People underestimate tremendously. Um, we can give you your food. And you can go home and then bring back what you didn't eat. But you can cheat all you want, and we won't know. So people have developed all these phone apps, and you take pictures of what you eat before and after. And again, these things help, but they are difficult. It's a difficult thing to measure. That's something that we struggle with. Hormones. We can measure hormones in the bloodstream metabolites like glucose and fats and things like that. But we're measuring in the peripheral blood. What really is important is what's happening in the brain. And yet we can't really measure that in a practical way. So there's a lot of problems with all these things that are important to measuring appetite regulation. But in humans, there, there are some issues with this. That's where we started using neuroimaging as a tool to get around some of these problems. With neuroimaging, we can get at potential appetite and behaviors, but have it not be so subjective. It's a more objective measure of these things. While we can't measure hormones and metabolites with MRI or neuroimaging, we can measure the response to these things. Uh, so uh, neuroimaging has become a very important tool. Neuroimaging is a very generalized word. It can be 
using EEG, just to look at electrical activity. It can be CAT scans to look at anatomy, MRI to look at anatomy, or functional <coughs> MRI, which is the tool we use, which looks at changes in blood flow, which equal to changes in neural activity in the brain. PET scanning is another tool that can be used to look at other things. So really, there's a number of different tools. The, the one that's used the most is functional <coughs> MRI or fMRI, which is the tool that we use. So here, what is fMRI? So we put an individual in a magnet, MRI magnet, like you would go for if you tore your ACL and you're getting your, your knee's uh, image. So you're sitting in a magnetic field, and it's uniform. What happens next? is we have the individual perform a task in the, in the fMRI machine. We want to, to stimulate the brain. And so, for example, we use images of food, so pictures of food. Uh, we do a gambling task in the scanner. We can, use, uh, we can do taste, and we've done taste in one study. Some investigators do smells. So there's all kinds of different tasks we can do in the scanner. And that changes the neuronal activity in the brain which then recruits more blood to the, that area of the brain. And so by measuring blood flow, we get at neuronal activity in response to this task. So at the end of the day, the change in blood flow changes the ratio of oxygen to the oxygenated blood to the deoxygenated blood. I know it's a little complicated. That equals neuronal activity. And it shows up as these little bright spots on these pretty pictures. <coughs> All right, so there have been a couple of studies before the one we published that looked at an acute effect of exercise on what's happening in the brain. So this was a 60-minute high-intensity uh, exercise, just one single bout compared to a rest. And what they found is that exercise in this, these black boxes decreased the brain activity in all these brain regions. And this is a bunch of Latin here, right? Insula, operculum, putamen, all kinds of fun. What, what did these brain regions do? Well, these are brain regions that are important food-related reward, motivation, anticipation. And so objectively measuring exercise seems to dampen the reward, motivation to eat. And that's high intensity where there's data that suggests that hunger ratings go down uh, and satiety goes up. So that's just an acute bout. And we have a similar study that did an acute bout of exercise in response to visual cues. And what they found is that, again, exercise was associated with reduced uh, activity in certain brain regions. So we have here, uh, you know, we have the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, we have the hippocampus, and we have the um, frontal cortex. And I'll go through that in a bit more in a, in a minute. Then we have these investigators that did an interesting study. They said, what about people who exercise more regularly? Does that impact the response to food? So this is more cross-sectionally. So they looked at self-reported exercise and how did that affect the neuronal response to high-calorie foods? And they found is the people who self-reported that they exercised a lot had reduced response of, in the brain to foods that, are, again, were important to reward, appetite, and general awareness. So again, these were brain regions like the frontal cortex, which is important. That's the cognitive brain. It's important for processing the reward signals of the body. Uh, the insula, which is this brain region here, is an area that we find that is affected over and over again. The insula is important for taste, uh, but also is important for awareness of the body and attention to what's happening around you and your own biology. And we find that these regions are impacted with exercise. And the more you, you report that you exercise, the more these areas were affected. So we did a study to look at this a little more effectively. So we did a six-month exercise intervention. Again, we tacked on to a study that my collaborator was, was doing. And we wanted to look at both behaviors and the brain response to, to food. And so we did this. So we had 12 individuals. This is a small study. It's a, what I call a pilot study. Um, these were relatively young people. I can say that now that I'm getting old. Uh, this used to be old. Um, they were overweight to obese, so BMI was around 33. They otherwise healthy non-smokers. Before the intervention, they were weight stable. They did not exercise on a regular basis. They were pretty much a sedentary group. And what did we do? Is we measured a bunch of these things at baseline. They then did a six-month progressive exercise intervention. 
The goal was about 2,500 calories of exercise per week, about 45 to 60 minutes a day, most days of the week. And it was based on exercise testing. And they, we did not try to change their eating behaviors. So there was no attempt to modify their diet in any way. Then we repeated all the assessments after this intervention. And so what did we find? What did we look for? We looked at body weight, body fatness, eating behaviors, things like restraint, disinhibition, cravings, appeal and desire for food. We looked at appetite ratings, so hunger, satiety in response to a meal. And then we did the brain imaging that I'll talk more about. So this was, again, just 12 people. The weight change was 102 down to 99 kilos. So on average, about three kilos of body weight, kind of similar to what most studies show, about 3% weight loss. But what you can see is some of the individuals lost weight, some remained plateaued. In this, stud this arm of the study, no one gained any weight. But certainly, it wasn't a tremendous amount of weight loss. And most of that weight was due to losses of fat mass, not an increase or a decrease in lean mass. And so what about the behaviors? What was the expectation is that as you're losing weight, you're burning more calories, you should have increase in your cravings. You should be hungrier. You should have more reward. Food should be more rewarding for you, right? And what we found is no effect. Again, this, these are small numbers. No effect on reward parameters, craving whether you are restrained or, or lose control over eating. So there seemed to be no effect on the behaviors per se. No real effect on satiety or on hunger before or after the exercise intervention. Again, we would have expected hunger to have gone up. We would have expected satiety um, to have gone down. But we did not see a dramatic effect in these type of parameters. All right. So I already said all this. I'm going to jump through this. So then we want to look at the brain response. Because again, this is more, more objective. All those other measures were very subjective. So we looked in, at different interventions. First, we showed them pictures. Showed them pictures of highly palatable foods, like cakes and other yummy stuff. These were images that were validated by a couple hundred people. Basic foods, and then things that were not images that were related to food. So controlled non-food objects, like a book, a chair, uh, things that could have been appealing or not. Um, and they ba we balance them based on lighting and color and those kind of things that can all be important in how the brain processes these things. All right, so the first thing is we wanted to look at the baseline. What's, what do these highly palatable foods do to your brain? And we've done this in a number of studies, and it's very re reproducible. So you bring people in, they're, they're fasting, they haven't eaten, so they're hungry, they're motivated to want to eat. And you show them these pictures of yummy foods, and we compare those images to a non-food, uh, and we see what's different about the brain. So we're looking at a yummy food versus a, a chair. These are all the brain regions that light up. And it's very robust it's very, and very consistent from person to person. Uh, we see this insula, which is important, again, for reward processing, uh, uh, awareness of the body, uh, sensory cortex, parietal, which is important in attention and focus and then visual cortex. So we know they're looking at both of these images, yet the visual cortex is more stimulated when you look at food. We think that means that relates to attention, focus to the food. Focus on the task. I'm hungry, I gotta eat, okay? This is kind of baseline. Now, we look at what happens after six months of exercise. And what we find is that if we look at different brain regions, for example, here's that insula, here was the average response before the exercise, here's the average response after. We see this nice reduction. And so what these pretty images show us is the parts of the brain that were more turned off after exercise than before exercise. So again, it was the parietal, less attention for food, insula, less reward processing and, uh, uh, and awareness related to food. And there was visual cortex was reduced after the intervention. These were with only 12 individuals, these are very significant changes. And we see this dramatic reduction in how the brain sees this food and without changing anything else. And interestingly, the change in this one brain region, the insula, correlated with how much weight they lost. And again, these are small numbers. It's a pilot study, and that's why we have more money to do these. But the more the brain region was turned off, the more weight was reduced in those individuals. 
And interestingly, we were able to actually tease it out into people who lost weight or didn't lose weight. Those who lost weight had a significant reduction in this insular activity. Those who didn't lose weight had no effect in this region. And these are only five or six people per group, so it's only speculative. But certainly, it's interesting. It's, it's, it certainly was hypothesis uh, generating to get us to do more studies. So there seems to be something about exercise that turn, wants to turn this brain region off. And, and if it does that, you're able to then lose weight, we think, because you're less interested in food, food is less rewarding. And the other individuals who don't have this response um, have more reward and are probably compensating and eating more. All right. And then, how are we doing on time? We're doing all right. The other thing we can measure in the brain with the fMRI technology is the resting brain. So what's interesting is a number of years ago, some investigators found that when you're doing nothing, the brain is still turned on, which makes sense, right? And when you go to do a task, and, and, and well, let me back up. So this, we call this the resting state or default network of the brain. So this is on, and it's this discrete, very reproducible pattern of activity in the brain. When someone goes to do a task, like look at a picture of food or do a test in the scanner, not only are certain brain regions turned on or off due to the task, but the resting part of the brain gets turned off. That makes sense. So you have to turn this off so that then you can have the other stuff work. So if this stays on, it, it creates too much noise. And we did a preliminary study that showed that obese individuals have problems with their default or resting state. Um, and I think this is it. So this is the typical pattern we see. We see this back of the brain and a little bit of the frontal part of the brain is turned on in, in rest. But what we found is that these, these are reduced obese people, but we see the same thing in obese, have more of these parts of the brain turned on than thin people. And we think that could be important from a biological perspective. So if this is, stays on all the time, when they go to look at food and think about how to uh, deal with the food environment, they, they can't focus on it because their resting part of the brain is still turned on. Does that make sense? Uh, it's, it's somewhat complicated to think about it that way. Um, and I probably need to think of a good uh, analogy to that that I haven't found yet. But what we found, interestingly, is that exercise affected this resting state. It decreased it in certain areas of the brain. And we think that might be a good thing, uh, to be then able to focus on your food environment in a more conducive, healthy manner. And so and the more this brain region, this default network was reduced, the greater the amount of fat and body weight loss that occurred in these you know, only 12 research individuals. But certainly, there's a pretty dramatic effect from baseline to post-exercise. All right, so let me kind of summarize that. So chronic exercise, based on the work we've done, associated with a reduction in neuronal response to food, primarily in brain regions known to be important in food intake regulation, as well as in this resting default uh, network of the brain. Is this a normalization? That's kind of the way I look at it. You're taking an, a, quote, a quote, abnormal brain, make people exercise, that quote, normalizes their brain to someone who wasn't obese. Now they're better able to deal with the food environment, potentially. They're more sensitive to the cues around them. Um, and we saw that there was a significant relationship between the changes in the brain and the change in the weight. It's not, I can't say that that's cause and effect, and that's why we're doing you know, more work looking at this. And really, what's interesting to me is that all these effects were driven by the people who lost weight. So if you didn't lose weight, you didn't see any changes in the brain. If you lost weight, you saw changes. Now, so is it the weight loss that caused the changes, or did the changes cause the weight loss? And that's what we want to answer next. All right. So success of physical activity or, or, or exercise may be, in terms of weight loss success, maybe through impacting motivation, reward, and attention for food. That's our, our end of our final conclusion here. All right, so concluding remarks. Physical activity is associated with less effects on appetite and energy intake than would be expected for the degree of negative energy balance. So you start exercising, negative energy balance, we don't get the full compensation that we would expect on average. 
but these effects are very quite variable from one person to the next, and I think that's the most important part. The effects of physical activity on the brain response to food cues is also quite variable and predicts changes in body weight, and I think that's important. And by understanding these mechanisms, because so at the end of the day, people say, well, so what? Who cares? You know, why is this important in our, in our minds? Is one, can we better predict the response to physical activity, for example, in this case? Or in the next case, it could be a specific diet or a drug. Can we hone in and do the personalized, individualized medicine that we are looking to do here in 2014 by using this type of technology? I'm not saying we can use MRIs and... Uh, in all our patients, but are there ways we can get at, are there markers of the brain response that we can uh, then use to predict who's going to lose weight with physical activity uh, and, and use that as a primary tool for weight loss. Again, I don't want to say, I don't want you to think that I'd, I wouldn't want to promote exercise in everybody, but if the pure goal is weight loss, we want to find the right tool for that individual and, and so that they have the best chance of success. Secondly, by understanding how exercise works, can then we develop newer tools, newer interventions that are more successful in weight loss or weight gain prevention. So by using the <coughs> mechanisms, we then can develop other ways of treating our patients. And this gets at our case, right? So our lady who went on exercise intervention on her own for three months and didn't lose any weight. So what do we, you know, had we known she wasn't going to lose weight, we wouldn't have told her not to exercise, but we would have been very much more aggressive with diet at the onset. And that would have been more successful for her and hopefully more motivating and, and have her be able to keep uh, losing weight and keeping it off long term. Potentially, by knowing, understanding her baseline, we could have altered her, um, her intervention. With the second guy, we want to understand, well, why is he losing weight? Because if I can understand how he loses weight, Maybe I can help the next person either by using exercise or using a tool that recreates exercise in a way. All right, so we're following this up with two studies that are both underway now. Uh, the first one examines the effects of exercise on appetite regulation after weight loss. So as I'm sure you've heard plenty about the last few days, is we can get just about anybody to lose weight in our research studies. The hardest part is having them keep the weight off over time. And so we know that exercise is a good tool for helping with weight loss maintenance. So the question is why? Is it because exercise just is more calories burned or is exercise, effect, is exercise affecting appetite regulation? And so we're doing a study currently where we're having people lose about 10% of their body weight and then they get randomized to either exercise or diet during a three month weight loss maintenance to see what happens to appetite regulation with those two different interventions. The second study is examining the effects of exercise at the onset during weight loss to look at the variability. So we're doing a much bigger study looking at people who ultimately will lose weight versus those who don't lose weight and we'll also have a controlled diet arm as well. So those are the two big studies that we're doing now. Other areas of interest would be Intensity of the exercise, does it matter if we're walking or running? Or, so is it high intensity or just lower intensity? Does that affect appetite regulation in a different way? Um, resistance training always comes up. Would this have a similar effect as more aerobic type training? And certainly something that we'd like to study. Does it matter when you exercise, the time of day? There's some evidence of maybe exercising in the morning before you eat, this is again, put in data from my collaborator, um, that suggests that maybe you get more burn on, on fat and things like that uh, if you exercise first thing in the morning. Does that help? Uh, or does exercising late in the evening do something to appetite regulation? So those are potentially important things. Um, and then finally, it, getting back to what Jim Levine likes to talk about is, is sedentary time and inactivity. That's become a very hot topic. And if we take individuals who are moderately active and then we make them sedentary, how does that impact appetite regulation? Or if we take sedentary people and just get them moving, not necessarily exercising, does that affect appetite regulation? And certainly, um, we're trying to get some preliminary data on a small study right now looking at those kind of things. There's a lot of people to help me do this, so I always like to point them out, including the NIH who's given me some good money to do these studies. 
American Diabetes Association is now funding one of my studies. Um, you know, and it's, it's this guy here, Jason Tregellis, is the one who does all the fMRI analysis along with his uh, assistant and now has become a faculty member, uh, Dr. McFadden. So these are, you know, and then Ed who's doing the exercise interventions uh, with me because uh, that's not my area necessarily. All right, so I'm done talking. We have, I think, 10, 15 minutes to uh, take questions or have some discussion time. It's very mean. I know. <laughs> but you ate lunch, right? So you shouldn't be hungry. Sorry. It shouldn't matter. So what you didn't know is there's a, this room has a big MRI in it, and I'm measuring your brain activity. All right. What questions do you all have? I know, I lost We're you guys somewhere. On the, on the cake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I, I have a question I can ask to, to yeah. start off. I was curious. So, um, when you were measuring the insulin in the brain, I noticed that the cluster pre exercise was more spread out and the cluster was tighter afterwards. Does that have any meaning at all? No, that's just the some of it is, is that when the cluster is very strong, it looks bigger just from the, the pic, you know, just the intensity. And so, the image kind of shows it as, as a wider area. Actually, and so, and so the dots on the graph, not the picture oh, of the brain, I see. but that, that the, the data more, was more spread out. More spread more out. And more, more tight. Graph. Right, so um, it's a good question. Um, I think what we're looking at is a change, and so over time, it may be that exercise is having an impact on everyone, and so it kind of brings everyone closer in. It could be a statistical deal where you have the regression to the mean, and that's the problem of doing these pre and post studies. That, you know, they're not the standard, gold standards. This is preliminary pilot data. Um, that's why we're doing the studies we're doing now. But certainly, there is going to be some habituation effect as people do the scan a second time. They, they're used to it, so there might be less noise because of that. Um, and we do, do show different images from time to time to reduce the risk of habituation. We'll show, you know, we show many, many images of different kinds of foods, but we'll, you know, at beginning and end, there may be a chocolate cake in both, but they're going to be slightly different chocolate cakes, so they're not looking at the exact same images. Um, but again, so there may be some tightening up of the noise because of that, but it could just be that the exercise is doing that. Other questions? <laughs> I think it's so interesting with the case of that lady who didn't lose the weight. Right. You, know, you kind of think, I mean, there, there's so much knowledge. When someone says, I think I'm eating healthy, you know. Right. You know, so I, I think from that, it seems that you, one would learn that, you know, if you're about to embark on an exercise program and you are, you intend to lose weight, that that diet needs to be analyzed as part of that because of those pitfalls of, A, nothing changing, or B, the increased desire. Right. Weekend. Absolutely. But I think in, if you go to the general public, they don't know that. Right. And so, and we find that over and over but is, again. Is that study concluded enough to, you know, share that with them? I, I think that there's enough evidence out there that there's compensation in enough individuals that they won't lose weight. I think, I think we could say that. I, there's, I mean, these are not tiny little studies, those earlier studies done from other people that we, because we, at the end of the day, it's about energy, right? And so if there's people gaining weight, they have to be consuming more food than they're burning. And so, uh, or if they're not losing weight, they have to be compensating. So yes, they may be more sedentary, but likely they're also eating more. Because it seems like the two big lessons from those two first studies were that if you're going to embark on an exercise plan with moderate, with moderate exercise mm -hmm. and yet not change your diet, you're going to have those two potential pitfalls. However, if you're about to embark on an exercise, a high intensity mm -hmm. program, I mean, obviously food still needs to be looked at, but your chances of success of avoiding those pitfalls seem to be higher. Absolutely. I think the other thing, though, is that it does seem that in some individuals, exercise somehow blunts the appetite effect. And With so, a high intensity, though. It seems well, I, I, the studies that we, see, we saw people lose weight, and we saw the brain changes. This was not high intensity. Okay. These were people walking on treadmills. Um, and so there's clearly a difference in their response. Like and so, so for some individual exercise, and, and so what is the mechanism, that's something that we want to continue to pursue, 
Is it a change in some type of one of these hormones that we think are important, which is ultimately upstream from there affecting reward and, and motivation? And does that happen in some individuals? And therefore, if you in intervene with diet, that would be even more powerful because maybe it's a natural appetite suppressant, and so they're able to really lose weight significantly. Whereas in other individuals, exercise is the opposite. It promotes appetite, and so you have to work harder to get the same effect. Um, so I think there, there's certainly differences. And then, so one is we want to understand what the mechanisms of how exercise might impact that, but number two, why would it be different in one individual compared to the other, and, and what would be those predictors? So why does the guy get an effect that's more appetite suppressant like versus the other person who doesn't. Um, is there something biologically that's going on or is this all uh, behavioral? Uh, uh, my guess is it's probably more likely to be biologic in terms of what's happening with the exercise, but um, then impacting the behaviors through these interactions between biology and, and, and behavior. It's, I don't think anybody does either. It's, it's a, two things, it's hard to understand what resting means because um, you're, you're always, if you're just lying there and you're not sleeping, you're still thinking about something, right? Um, so what happens is if you take 100 brains and you look at activity and everybody while they're thinking about things or doing things and you look at what's in common with everything, it's this resting state. Everyone has this resting amount of activity in their brain. It's like the ambient noise of their brain. And what we, I think what's more important is the ability to shut that off. It appears to be more conducive to better cognitive function, better lots of things. So for example, people with schizophrenia have this high level of resting state and they aren't able to shut that down. And we know that those individuals can't focus on tasks. You know, they're all over the place. And, and so we think that this rest state is important, not so much in what it is doing at rest, but in its, the inability to shut it down when you're going to do other tasks is the, the pathophysiology, the problem. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> and so we found that obese individuals have less of an ability to shut that down in general, and others have found that too. And then exercise was associated with a better ability to shut that resting brain down, which then potentially allows the rest of the brain to work more effectively from a, a networking perspective. So does that mean that um, obese people in general might have like impaired cognitive function because they can't turn off Yes, the yes, and there is evidence for that. And there's evidence that weight loss improves that. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly, yes. Now what I don't know is how do you change the resting state besides we know that weight loss potentially helps. Exercise seems to help a little bit. These are all very preliminary type studies, but certainly could get at the be other benefits besides just weight, but more cognitive function type things. Is there research underway on the specific ways that, that these hormones, leptin, ghrelin, et cetera, how they work in the brain? I mean, I know you said, I think they work in the hypothalamus but how, how they actually make us eat stuff. I mean, for example, if I'm, you know, I have five decades of watching my weight, um, and, I, and I know that if I've lost a few pounds, I'm far more attentive to food in my environment, and even if I'm thinking, okay, that's it, I've eaten as many calories as I'm gonna be allowed today, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna eat any more calories, then I'll be sort of thinking about something else and walk past the bowl of grapes and take a handful right. without thinking about it. It's like my brain has just um, fooled me you know, into focusing on something else while it goes and eats the grapes. Is that, uh, is, it that is it those hormones and is there research about that? Yeah, that's, that's, that, those are great questions. That's exactly what we're seeing. You know, and, and, and interesting, we just start publishing a study on, I had, lean and overweight people under eat. And I found that the lean people with just under eating for a day, so 40% less calories, their brains just go crazy for food. The obese people, it didn't affect anything. <laughs> and so, which, you know, so they seem, 
people who once they, at least once they've gained weight to a certain degree, it's like they're less sensitive to changes, and I think that's an important, important problem. So does that all this relate to biologic signals or not? That's where it's less clear. We know that leptin and other hormones are important. And when we do brain imaging studies looking at these hormones, I mean, I haven't done them, but I, with colleagues, especially in England, they like to infuse these, these things into people. Um, uh, we've learned that hypothalamus is important because that's, that's like the involuntary part of the brain, you know, that's controlling inherent beha you know, uh, behaviors without having to think about it. But all of these hormones impact higher brain areas including the insula, the striatum, which is reward, frontal cortex processing a reward. Um, and so there is clearly uh, connections from the central hypothalamic brain to, these, to the higher brain, which ultimately is going to lead to the behaviors, as you're talking about. Because um, at the end of the day, you still have to choose to put the thing in your mouth and eat it and chew it, right, and, and, and swallow it. So um, sometimes we do that without thinking, but you still have the motor, the, I mean, all of that still has to happen. And so, um, for example, you know, we know that there are individuals who don't have leptin. So they're leptin deficient people. Uh, there aren't very many. Um, and when you give them leptin, they lose a lot of weight. So there's been some neuroimaging studies with these, these, these people. And they've shown that if they give uh, without leptin, their reward brain is going crazy. They give leptin, it's, it, it attenuates, it blunts all the response to food. And so it's not just the hypothalamus. Now, in animal models, and in, 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 you know, when you can take the brains and tear them apart, you can see all the signaling that's happening in the hypothalamus and, and the brain uh, around the hypothalamus. But at the end of the day, it's still connections to higher brain that, that likely is, is, is the issue. So we think that an intervention like exercise may be having its effects through leptin sensitivity. Again, we don't know. It's going to be hard to test in humans. Um, but certainly, uh, it's a reasonable hypothesis um, to explain what we're, we're, we're seeing. And we know that individuals have varying levels of sensitivity to leptin, and so might explain why some individuals respond to exercise more than others. Um, but certainly, uh, th I think there's an important uh, effects there. But the higher brain seems to be overpowering. OK, other questions? One or two more, if anybody's got them. Uh, okay, thank you. Hey, thank you. <laughs>